Russia's people in power, and I'm Summer El Shahat. On today's program, the toxic truth. Il valore della vita umana. The value of human life is equal to zero. The only thing that they value is money and more money. They just don't care. Somalia is a country in the grip of complete lawlessness. It's a failed state which today is almost a no-go zone for journalists who are deliberately targeted by the various warring factions that control the country. But in 1994, despite there being no central authority and violent clashes between feuding clans, journalists were still able to operate in Somalia. It was during this time that Italian journalist Ilaria Alpi and her cameraman Miran Ravatin were in Somalia investigating the use of Italian aid projects as fronts for arms smuggling and toxic waste dumping. But this was a story that someone didn't want told. They were both murdered. An Italian court convicted one man of their murder. But that isn't the end of the story, because a judge recently ruled that the case must remain open as the people who ordered the killings remain at large. This is Hashi Omar Hassan, a 38-year-old Somali. He was found guilty in an Italian court of the murder of Italian journalist Ilaria Alpi and her cameraman Miran Rovatin in Mogadishu, Somalia, in 1994. Hashi was the only person convicted for the murders, despite the fact that there were seven men in the car that carried the killers. Hashi is presently serving 26 years in prison. We wanted to talk to Hashi Omar Hassan, but we were denied access to him by the Italian Penitentiary Administration on the basis that he is a high security detainee. Giorgio and Luciana Alpi have been trying to shed light on their only daughter's death since 1994. Over the last 15 years, there hasn't been a real investigation. We are two parents who still wait to know who killed our daughter and why. We still don't know. Douglas Duale is Hashi Omar Hassan's lawyer. The idea of killing the two journalists originated in Italy, not in Somalia. Somalia only did the handiwork. In July, the presiding judge refused the prosecutor's request to close the case on the basis that the people who order the killings are still at large. The most likely and reasonable reconstruction is that of a commissioned murder, an assassination that took place to prevent the information gathered by Alpi and Rovatin on the traffic of weapons and toxic waste between Italy and Somalia being brought to the attention of the public. March 20th, 1994. Somalia is in the midst of civil war. The Siad Bare regime has fallen. Two armed factions control Mogadishu and the city is split in two along the so-called Green Line, monitored by UN troops. Italian state TV reporter Ilaria Alpi and her cameraman Miran Rovatin are on a mission to Somalia. They were officially there to cover the retreat of Italian troops, but from my understanding, from what I've seen of her notes, she was also there to complete an ongoing investigation. Ilaria, 32, and with a good knowledge of Arabic, had just landed in Mogadishu from the northern Somali coastal town of Bosasso. I remember looking at my watch. It was 12.30 Italian time when she called to say she had returned to Mogadishu. We felt relieved because she was now among other journalists and people she knew. She didn't sound worried. Two hours later, the phone rang again. At 2.30 Italian time, I received a call from her television channel telling me she was dead. This footage was recorded in the hours following the double murder. After calling her parents, Ilaria Alpi left the Sahafi Hotel, together with Mira Rovatin, her bodyguard Mohamed Nuradin, and her driver Ali Mohamed Abdi, they crossed the Green Line into Mogadishu North and drove to the Amana Hotel. Upon leaving, Alpi and Miran were attacked by a pickup truck carrying seven armed militiamen. <laughs> Versions differ on why Ilaria was heading into northern Mogadishu. Domenico D'Amati, the Alpi family lawyer, believes that she had been lured into an ambush. 
We know that the Somali police had carried out an investigation. They suggest that Ilaria Alpi was lured into the trap by means of a phone call and then killed. What we know for sure is that shortly thereafter, both Miran and Ilaria lay dead, each with a single bullet wound to the back of their heads, while both the driver and the bodyguard were left alive. We've been told that the attacker's reaction was triggered by the shots fired by Alpi's bodyguard. Nevertheless, the assailants did not fire back at the bodyguard as expected. Instead, they shot inside the car. In the hours following the double murder, a number of useful elements disappeared. Three of five notebooks carried by the journalist were lost, as were the photos of the dead bodies. Alpi's camera was also gone, as was some of the footage the two had recorded during their stay. We tried to obtain the death certificate, which they never gave us. Her medical records, which we never got. Several prosecutors took on the case, as did two parliamentary commissions of inquiry, the second of which concluded that Ilaria and Miran were on a pleasure trip to the beach. Several people connected to the case have died in mysterious circumstances, and one key witness has been killed. The driver of Alpi's car, Ali Mohammed Abdi, who testified in court against Hashi Omar Hassan, was murdered just days after returning to Somalia from Italy. 1,400 billion lire, where did this impressive amount of money end up? These words are written in one of Ilaria Alpi's remaining notepads. It shows that the journalist was looking into the misuse of Italian development aid to Somalia. Parlano di, questa, di questo scandalo, di questo um, proprietario somalo con passaporto italiano, si, che si chiama Mugne, che avrebbe preso queste navi che erano di proprietà dello Stato e le avrebbe usate a suo uso privato. Lui? Lui. Lui solo. This is the last interview shot by Ilaria Alpi and Miran Rovatin. It took place in the northern Somali coastal city of Bosasso. The interview with the local sultan, Musa Bogor, is about the hijacking by Somali pirates of a fishing trawler donated to Somalia by the Italian government. E dov'è la nave? Non la possiamo vedere? Come la potete vedere? Perché lei viene dal sismo, perché deve vedere? Prendi informazione e basta. Se non vedo non credo. Se non vedo non credo. O si lei il satellite, no? L'ultima intervista di Ilaria è... Ilaria's last interview should be shown in journalism courses because it is the last trace we have on the work she was carrying out. Everything stems from this interview. Maurizio Torrealta is one of Alpi's colleagues. He picked up the slain journalist's investigation. I interviewed the same person Ilaria had interviewed. His name is Musa Bogor, and he confirmed that it was known that these ships were involved in arms trafficking. These vessels had been donated to Somalia through the Italian Development Aid Program. Torre Alta began looking into the activities of the ships owned by the Somali high seas fishing company, Shifco, donated to the former Italian colony by Italy's aid program. A 2003 UN report on the violations of the Security Council's arms embargo on Somalia claims that the Shifko fleet was used to deliver weapons to Somalia on behalf of arms dealer Monser al in 1992. The arms were bought in Poland, were cleared by Polish customs with documentation indicating the entire shipment was bound for Latvia, were then shipped onward to Yemen, but eventually ended up in Somalia. The Shifko ships were apparently also used to smuggle weapons to other destinations. I tried to trace the routes taken by these ships. I realized they would go to Iraq, Iran and Ireland. These routes have nothing in common with fishing. According to the Lloyds Maritime Records, Shifko fleet's mothership, the 21 October 2, bought with Italian aid money, traveled back and forth between the Indian Ocean and the Mediterranean Sea. Witnesses interviewed by Torre Alta say weapons were loaded in Tripoli and transported to Beirut in early 1992. More weapons apparently left the Irish harbor of Kilibegs and reached Iran in mid-1994.